From the meter, we move on to the story of Apollo. The Homeric hymn to Apollo, the one that we're going to read, the longer, more extended one, is interesting when one looks at it, uh, right, just uh, looking at uh, its, its very outlines. You'll see that our translator, Sarah Rudin, has decided to actually have two separate names inside of this Homeric hymn to Apollo, one of which is the Homeric hymn to Delian Apollo. The other is the Homeric hymn to Pythian Apollo. Those are legitimate moves by our translator, but they're not there in the original manuscript. We don't know for sure that these were thought of as two separate hymns, but it probably is the case that they were. What we've got is a story about Apollo that begins, has a lot of action in it, and then seems to end after a couple of hundred lines where the poet says, goodbye, Apollo. Then all of a sudden, we jump into a new story about Apollo that begins, moves through, we hear a more extended story about Apollo, and then we hear a goodbye Apollo come out again. From this, most of us have concluded that this Homeric, this single Homeric hymn to Apollo is actually two hymns sewn together. Uh, this is a decision that Rudin has uh, expressed in a very legitimate move in giving the two pieces of this separate titles. But remember, in the manuscript, they're all one. Uh, it's helpful for us to remember that because there's some explaining that has to do for a poet that would present this as a single hymn to Apollo. And I think that, uh, that, well, that question will be interesting for us to answer in just a few moments. But let's take a look at this first piece of it and see how this hymn to Apollo works. Apollo is a very powerful god. He is frightening. So frightening that when Leto is trying to find a place to give birth to him, most places turn her down and say, no, we don't want that god to be associated with us. It's a terrifying god that's about to emerge. We hear of Leto's journey as she goes place to place to place, trying to find a place to give birth to Apollo. Now, we talked about lists in our introduction to the Homeric hymns. We've talked about them already with respect to Hesiod. Uh, interesting to note that the locations that get mentioned in this Homeric hymn to Apollo as points where Leto is trying to find a birthplace for him, all are places that give cultic worship and have cultic connections with Apollo. So the hymnic author is giving us a way, all of us out there in the Greek world, to understand, yes, that's the connection that this place has with Apollo. It, it harkens back to them being a place that Leto considered as a place to try to give birth uh, to her son. We have some uh, further reference that gets built into this of uh, Leto trying to find this spot for her uh, uh, to give birth. Artemis emerges from her at the same time. The twins come out of her. Uh, Apollo is the one that we uh, hear about in this story, but the linkage between Apollo and Artemis and Leto is strong, rich, uh, well attested throughout the tradition. When Apollo arrives, uh, after he's, uh, or sorry, when Leto has found her birthplace for Apollo to arrive on Delos, she has to make kind of bribery and promises. Listen, Delos, you're going to be famous. We're going to do good things for you, so please just let me have birth here. Delos then relents after the, the promise of riches and fame uh, and allows that the birth should happen there, the island being personified. At that point, uh, Leto enters into nine days of labor. Nine days of labor. The number nine showing up again as indicative of a very long time. We we'll recall that nine showed up in our Homeric hymn to Demeter, again, in the context of something very long connected to the Eleusinian mysteries, uh, the rites of the Eleusinian mysteries. Here, the labor stretches out over nine days. Unbelievable. Um, Apollo then emerges, declares his purview. He's going to say what he's all about and what his specialties are. He has the, uh, overlook, uh, the overview over prophecy. One of the important pieces of the world that Apollo keeps an eye on is prophecy. He's careful to say, though, he will be a prophetic view, or he will have a prophetic view of the will of Zeus. Uh, Apollo's relationship with Zeus is interesting. Apollo's extremely strong, powerful god. There are some aspects in the, in the tradition that suggest that Apollo may have been, at some point, thought of as the very top of all the gods. Uh, the ver they're very small and very subtle, built into this hymn to Apollo. One of them is his, de his explicit mentioning of Zeus as he's declaring his purview and talking about himself as, yeah, I'm going to fit right there beneath this god. He's, he's, he's being careful not to make a challenge of Zeus. No, no such thing 
ever exist, that we hear a direct challenge of Zeus. But we'll pull out as we see some of the aspects of Apollo that lead us to think, well, wow, he really was extremely powerful in the Pantheon. And maybe even suggest so powerful that he could have been the most important one. He then jumps right into an initiation of, of his cultic practice, finding his place in the world and having humans worship him. This is what I'm going to want. Lays things down. We hear about the famous Delian maidens and the song that they sing. That gets us uh, uh, right up to speed on we, what we Greeks would know of as a very famous ritual activity that happens on the island of Delos, the Delian maidens singing in Apollo's honor. Uh, that gets us to this uh, beautiful site. Uh, thank you to uh, one of our co-teachers who's uh, figured out, uh, who's, who's helped us with beautiful uh, photos that she's taken, Caitlin Gillespie. Uh, here's Delos. I mean, can you imagine? Beautiful. Uh, there are beautiful wildflowers. Apollo's birthplace uh, being here immortalized uh, in natural beauty. So we make it to Delos. Uh, things are, uh, we, we hear about this establishment of a cult there. Uh, we've got uh, what seems very much like a conclusion goodbye and off we go, uh, be nice to me, gods. These, this is the way hymns end. Now, as I said, in the, in the, tr in the tradition, um, the manuscript that appears in the Greek, there is no distinction between these two. One line flows right into the next. We've drawn from the clear motif of ending here and then into what seems like a new beginning, the conclusion that what we've got here is two hymns put together. Most likely that's what's happened. Uh, we've got these two hymns put together. But uh, it could also be the case that w we have to ask the question, when did that sewing together happen? It could be the case that it happened well after any performative context so that we had a uh, uh, one hymn from one religious festival survived, another hymn did, over many generations copying uh, of the manuscript happened, and the two hymns just got sewn together by copyists at a much later period. It could also be the case that a single hymnist decided to take what were traditionally two hymns to Apollo, sew them together, and present one single hymn to Apollo to an audience. Some of what would have presented some difficulties are, uh, over, uh, uh, are, are papered over. So for example, what's the most important location that Apollo has a connection with? Well, some will say it's Delos. Uh, we've got a huge and very wealthy temple that's located there. Others are going to say, my gosh, that's crazy. It's not Delos. Apollo is clearly most associated with Delphi, this very famous site where uh, we have the Delphic Shrine to Apollo. Now, a hymnist that wanted to kind of make both parties happy, some of whom claimed that Delos was the rightful place to understand as Apollo's main site of connection in his, uh, in, in his life, and some who wanted to claim that Delphi was, well, this hymnist gives us a way to think, well, both are. We've got the birth happening at Delos, that's very important, and then we have the long extended uh, establishment of himself, uh, much more extended establishment of himself happening at Delphi in the second part of this hymn as a way to make sure that those at Delphi feel like they're included as well. Uh, I think what's probably, or what's, what's possible in this, um, in this double hymn to Apollo is that we've got a hymnist uh, who's very skilled at making sure his audience think that he thinks that him, him, his him is going to be the best. He's trying to give us both together so that all parties feel like they've done something uh, to contributed uh, to Apollo's background.